This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Well, I guess, I guess this means we're halfway through our broadcast week here in our flagship energy program, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, on Wednesdays at 4. And we do this with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. My co-host, I'm Jay Fidel. <laughs> My co-host today, Veronica Rocha. Hello. From DBED. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's okay, been fun. We, we have three guests, actually. Uh, we have the first guest who is going to stay through the show, and that is Erlyn Miley. She's a manager of Distributed Energy Resources Operations, uh, Hawaiian Electric Company. And to her left is Ted Peck. He's the CEO of Holu Energy and, me and member of the Distributed Energy Resources Council of Hawaii. Welcome to you both. Well, aloha. Thank you for nice having to have me. you here. Yeah. So, uh, Veronica, could you could you define this part of our show? What is the scope of our first discussion today? Okay. So the overall discussion is going to be about distributed energy resources. What's the status? What's new? And let's also talk about the future. So there's going to be two segments. The first segment is going to be focused on advanced inverter features. What are they? How can they be helpful? Any potential concerns from industry? The second segment is going to be around this concept of hosting capacity. So. To get us started, uh, why don't I ask, first question for Erlene, what is an inverter and what's an advanced inverter? And then maybe we can ask uh, Ted a follow-up question that actually he and I were talking about earlier today. Erlene, before you get to that, can you tell us what distributed energy resources is? Ah, so distributed energy resources is a more global term than just saying like rooftop PV. So it's any kind of a resource that's distributed throughout the system, so not a utility source okay. at our power station. You're an engineer, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you can always tell. <laughs> well, anyway, so answer, answer uh, Veronica's question now. So Veronica, your question was what is an inverter and what are advanced inverters? Yes. Okay, so inverters are the devices that take the energy from the rooftop PV and convert it so that we can connect it into our system and use it, and use it on our grid. So the newer, more advanced inverters, these have functionality that we have been looking at for the last several years, and they really fall into two different categories. So we have autonomous functionality and then functionality that can be triggered by, say, a cell phone signal. We've really been focusing on the autonomous functions. And basically how these autonomous functions work is, for example, if the PV starts to see high voltage, then, or, or then the advanced inverter will adjust the voltage before it gets to a point of causing power quality issues or even damaging people's equipment. And Hawaiian Electric, we've really been on the leading edge of this. And one example would be in 2014, we were the first utility to actually require that the ride through capability. And this is really important because what happens is when we have a generator trip offline, without that ride through capability, what was happening is the rooftop PV would also trip offline. So as you can imagine, we already have a situation where we don't have enough generation and this would just make it even worse. And it could also run into a situation where we'd have, you know, just collapse of the grid. So with the ride through settings, it keeps the rooftop PV on so things don't get worse. The challenge has been, since we are leading the industry, we are actually ahead of the equipment manufacturers and the, you know, the standard body. So we've been having to work really closely with them to you know, help them to get where we need to be. You want to motivate them to go further and faster. Right. <laughs> so Distributed Energy Resources Council, which your company is one of the, I guess, companies that are part of that council. Right. Uh, what, what's your take on advanced inverter uh, functions and features? Is that something that you guys are really excited about? Or? Well, it's... Yeah, what are your thoughts? It's, it's actually one of the core reasons why the DER Council exists. It's because uh, technology, as we know, can move very fast. And DER Council was formed as an industry group 
so that those companies which were bringing those advanced capabilities to the grid uh, would have a singular voice, a coordinated voice, uh, working with the utility and working with the PUC Commission and the legislature for uh, helping shape uh, the system, you know, really the grid of the future that we've been talking about for a while. Mm -hmm. So give me an example of how these advanced inverter features, so this question is for both of you. You, you provided one example. And it, by the way, I've been involved in this distributed energy resources docket now that's been going on for several years. And there are so many terms that are tossed around, volt, watt, volt, var, frequency, like all these things, right? But let's just whittle it down. What does it mean in terms of being able to interconnect more renewables and why should we care? It really is important because with these advanced inverter functions, there's a really good possibility that you can avoid some of the traditional upgrades that we're used to. So rooftop PV, just because of the, the nature of the PV where it comes and goes, it works during the day, it doesn't work at night, and that changing with the advanced inverter functions, we probably don't have to do line upgrades or line replacements, and that saves everyone money. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. So you said before that there were two kinds, autonomous and, and uh, uh, cell phone. Remotely controlled. Remotely controlled. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, how big is an inverter? How big is it? Oh. Is it big it like depends. a cigar box? They're like, they're like, it's like a box on a wall. It's depending a, depending on how many so kilowatts it's not bigger of its capacity. It, no. it, it can be. like this. Well, a home system, And yeah, one, it goes, one inverter goes like through one cell, cell panel, or, or one inverter no. can go from many cell panels. There, there's, a, there's a technology called microinverters. Enphase was the leader in that, where you, it was under, it's, it, every panel has its own inverter. Yeah. And so you have uh, alternating current, or AC, like what's in your house, through the whole system. The panel itself, as Erlene was talking about, produces direct current, and so you have to, at some point, Convert it. So that's the whole thing. The inverter, you need an inverter no matter what. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the primary function in terms of the electricity is you're converting from direct to alternating current. Yeah? Right. So <clears throat> now you've got the possibility of, of an autonomous system, and they're very smart. Autonomous mm -hmm. systems are very smart. They get lots of software in there. And then, which is driven by whatever it is, it's driven by the power that's going through the system, through the inverter. Yeah? Um, and then you got this cell phone kind. It strikes me that if you want to have all of these things working together, sort of like a swarm of, of drones, you mm -hmm. know, they're all connecting, talking to each other, you want the kind that are remotely connected, right? Ultimately, that would be what we would want to be able to control, because right now it's collectively, rooftop PV can be the largest generator on our system that is uncontrollable by yeah. us. That's tough. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, collectively, it would be good to have control over all these features. Yeah. We're not there yet. But, you know, this has been, like, a, kind of a controversial issue, yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is my question for you, Ted. So what do you, in terms of controllability and distributed energy resources like PV, which uh, inverters would be part of, what, what sort of opportunities does it bring to the market, and what sort of concerns does the market have? Yeah, so I'll go back a little bit and kind of talk about, you know, the wave that was, you know, five to ten years ago. Um, for lack of a better term, the inverters were pretty dumb. They just basically <laughs> took DC and converted it into a waveform, and it really didn't care what was on the other side, right? And as Erlene talked about, uh, if, if the frequency of the grid varied a little bit, if there was a transient, uh, they just trip off to protect themselves, and that ended up exacerbating that transient. So opening up that bandwidth, which they would ride through, really helped the grid. Um, technology being what it is, um, there's just a relentless race, you know, in the market for people adding capabilities and making uh, the inverters very interactive, both to the load and to the grid. And so, um, whereas in that first wave, um, there was concerns and they were largely valid that the more distributed energy resources you put on the grid, you, you, you weaken that circuit because those, those resources, as Erlene said, weren't controllable and they would kind of drive what happened on that circuit. Mm. But what we're seeing now is that the inverters that are available actually add strength to the grid, as Erlene was mentioning, so that you don't actually have to pay for upgrades to the grid. What, what's strength here? What's, what's, 
But my, my understanding is you need to have a black box to cooperate with the other black boxes and, right. give, and give the utility a better quality of power. And uh, their as, customers. As, and the customers, And the yeah. customers a better mm -hmm. quality of power. Um, how does it do that? How does it, what strength mean? In, me, in my mind, it's sponginess. It means that the Spongy. grid you is resilient. Here resilient. I hope, you know, because this is going to be the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> sponginess, sponginess, right there. <laughs> it, it, it means that the grid is responsive to transients. It's responsive to inputs. Uh, it means that uh, if there are needs on when it comes to VARs, uh, which is uh, reactive power is what it's called. We don't need to... It's a very technical, <laughs> you can talk with engineers for days, and uh, I think I kind of understand it, which means I, I, pr I understand it from a physics level, not from an engineering level, probably. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, power that's, that's being delivered, uh, the voltage and the frequency. These are all things that the utility is responsible for, and the inverters that are coming available now in this new wave of technology, they help the utility to manage those functions, those assets on the grid. Okay, well, the big question is, is the population of the system with these things. So do I go out and buy my own? Um, do you approve the one I buy? Do you buy the, the, the inverter and give it to me or install it somewhere? Does it have to be at my home? Can it be somewhere else? I'm asking a multiple compound question. <laughs> and my, ultimate, my ultimate question, Elaine, is how far along the, the path are we? Are we 100% in, in smart inverters or are we 10%? Where are we? We're starting to require smart inverters. Um, the, the standards are still you know, being developed. Um, we have on our website, you can always go to our website and see which inverters are, are uh, meet either the old inverter standards or the new inverter standards. We are starting to offer customers, if they're in a situation where they're not able to connect, we are offering advanced inverters as an option. And we do have people coming back and saying, yeah, here's your, do a, do a study, maybe have to pay for upgrades or put on an advanced inverter and be connected sooner. They're jumping on that. Yeah, so if I have an inverter in my house right now and I want to take advantage of this new technology, presumably more efficient, and stronger, more resilient, whatever. Uh, I don't want that because I always want the latest technology. <laughs> what do I do? You talk to your inverter man or your contractor who installed your system, mm -hmm. and I would have them come out and, and take a look at what you have and whether you want to replace them. Down the road, there is going to be a point in time where you are, you are going to need to replace your equipment. I'm going to guess that by that time, you're going to need to go with advanced inverters anyway. Yeah. That's some of the old ones are just starting to be phased out. In you're, not, a way. you're not going to be able to get them. You know, yeah. <laughs> no one sell them anymore. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, should I, you know, but like a lot of technology, should I wait for the next model? Or is the next <laughs> model here? You can always wait for the next model with technology. <laughs> it depends. How soon do you want to connect? Soon. I'd go with what you got out okay. there. <laughs> go to right. our website, find the right model. All right, the website is? Uh, www.wineelectric.com. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Veronica, can you summarize so we can take our break and switch out? Sure thing. Mm -hmm. So advanced inverter features, they're the new, next generation of inverter features. They help make uh, the grid more spongy. <laughs> um, they help uh, with uh, more uh, adoption, deployment of renewable energy. Uh, a lot of the standards around advanced inverters are still being developed and it sounds like you have a little bit of time to wait before you really have to rush out and switch out your old inverter for your uh, new advanced inverter. So with that, I'm really appreciative of uh, Ted and Erlene for participating in this session. And uh, I guess we're going to be right back, right? Okay, we take a short break. We'll be right back. Ted Peck, uh, Erlene Miley, thank you so much for coming around. Thank and you. And Erlene, don't go. Don't leave town. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. Very nicely spoken. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Ethan Elm, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. 
every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. I told you, I told you to be back, and we're back. That's Veronica Rocha on the other side, my co-host on this program, and uh, somebody who stayed around for the next half, <laughs> this is uh, Arlene Miley. And we got a new face, and that's uh, Aram Shumavan, who's the Chief Executive Officer of KavalaAnalytics.com. And something, let me ask you, Aram, Keska say Kavala Analytics, what do they do? What do you do? How do you spend your day? <laughs> uh, I spend my day trying to make sure that we are as efficient as possible gathering information about the electric grid and the built environment. So we map all of the uh, country's electric grid, all of the buildings that produce or consume electricity and describe their relationship to each other to try to figure out where value is uh, in, in the electricity markets. Wow, and you're sitting here at our table. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening here yeah. right now. Okay, Veronica, why don't you define the scope of this quarter hour? Absolutely. It's very much in line with what uh, Aram's work uh, is at Kavala. So we're going to be talking about hosting capacity. What is that and how does it relate to being able to interconnect more renewable energy at both the circuit level but also at the system level? So uh, my first question again for Eileen is, what is hosting capacity at the circuit level and at the system level? Can you get us started with that concept? Okay. So what hosting capacity is, is it's a methodology for uh, our planners use to, and they model the system and the hosting capacity is the amount of PV that could be connected either at the neighborhood, so the you know, the circuit level, or on the larger system at the, at the grid level, so the system level. So that's the amount of PV that can be safely connected. Yeah, I got the word hosting. Hosting. I mean capacity. I got capacity. That <laughs> means you, you got you can take more. Okay, but hosting. Who's the host? The what grid. It, what does it mean? The grid is the. The host. grid is the host. So, so when you say hosting capacity, you, you mean this is the, this this much can go into the grid. In oh. this particular location, or in this neighborhood, or on this circuit, or on this larger system. Okay. But correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, the beautiful thing about hosting capacity in the context of, you know, the, the way that HECO has implemented it or is looking to implement it, because it's still yet to be approved by the Public Utilities Commission, is that hosting capacity is, call it like a, at a point in time, right? So it's the capacity up until when you start to encounter either circuit or system level challenges. And at that point, you're able to then evaluate what, you know, what are the, the things that are causing those issues and what would it take in terms of resources, including money, to be able to make upgrades and then allow for greater hosting capacity. At least that's how I, I think about it, but maybe you can... No, that's a really yeah. good way of looking at it. Um, what I like to think of it is the real benefit, and it is, you know, something that, that is considered a best practice, hosting capacity, but the way... I think of it is really what the benefit to uh, customers are is that we know what that hosting limit is, so what that, that upper limit is. And so it's actually the customers have benefited because they've been able to connect faster. Mm -hmm. As long as we're under that hosting capacity, that's the, their analysis is done. They can get approval. Okay. So um, if there's hosting capacity, the customer still has to submit an application and then you just immediately yes. stamp it and let them interconnect or do you still have to do more studies? We, we do still need to check on the secondary side to make sure everything's okay. But mm -hmm. there's a couple of other benefits for the hosting capacity and one is it gives industry, we have areas that are saturated, and so they know where those areas are. So it helps the PV, people that are selling these systems, you know, like, that's probably not a good area. It's very transparent. You should, you know, over here has a lot more hosting capacity available. And then it also helps us with our planning, because we know where these hotspot areas are that we should be looking at when we do our upgrades anyway. Well, yeah. this could change things then. What's, what's it called, what you're doing now? It's the reverse of hosting capacity. What's it called? Um, 
Just regular distribution regular planning, distribution. yeah. <laughs> okay, so when you have hosted capacity, you're changing the way you look at things. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked before the show, I, I compared, and you felt this was a reasonable comparison to <laughs> retirement plans. There's two kinds of retirement plans. There's a defined benefit plan and a defined contribution plan. <laughs> So now we're on the contribution side, but we're going to change that to a defined benefit plan. We're actually are already capacity. using it. We're already using yeah, it. Yeah, we are using, using it. it. But you said something a minute ago. You said the PUC has to approve it in some way. Yeah. What does the PUC have to say? That they agree with the methodology. Okay. And how is this going to affect me How's as, it going to as affect a customer? You? How is this going to affect me? Um, are you applying for PV? Let's assume I was. Okay, so for one thing, you can look online and you can see we have these maps that are updated online. So you can kind of look at your neighborhood and if your area is already red, you're going to kind of know you'll have trouble. But just because your area is green or very good, you still might have trouble on your secondary, but at least you kind of have an idea to start there. Does this mean that some people who can't get on now will be able to get on? Um, Chances are, there's if there's upgrades that need to be incorporated, or like we talked about in the last 15 minutes, they might be able to, if it, this issue is just on their secondary side, advance inverters. Ah, so the two are connected. Connected. Veronica, it's brilliant. <laughs> two parts segment of the show one, segment two. And actually, one works with the other. it's also connected to Aram's work. And so why don't you talk to us a little bit about what uh, Kavala's doing and how, how does Kavala view hosting capacity in making the information that you're gathering and that you're evaluating publicly available so that people, everybody, can take advantage of it. Sure. So um, uh, I think the, uh, it's a very good description of what hosting capacity is. It really is the point at which you start to, the utility in particular, starts to inter incur costs mm -hmm. for trying to put more of a resource on the grid. And being able to have visibility into where that occurs can let companies that are trying to be as efficient as possible uh, figure out where they should be focusing their attention. The concern becomes, if you're in an area where it's been determined that it might be more expensive, are you sort of left out? And one of the things that we are trying to do is look at the, the total value to the system to figure out, are there areas where, even though it may cost a little bit more to put solar on the grid here, it actually delivers more value, and as a result of that, we can find ways for facilitating uh, increases to the hosting capacity uh, in areas where it actually is a savings to all rate payers. That's Autumn, how very do you do that? Yeah. Uh, uh, you talking about analytics, which is really, to me, a magic word. <laughs> it involves all kinds of algorithms and it's special magic. dashboards. And, and magic. It's computer yeah, that's magic. That's how we do it. Was it artificial <laughs> intelligence? Uh, we do a little bit of artificial intelligence uh, in some of our data ingestion. Uh, but most of what we're doing uh, now as part of this process that we call POG, the Pathways to an Open Grid, is really trying to build an understanding of where this value might uh, vary. What's and, value and mean in this context? So it, it might be, as an example, an area where uh, where Hawaiian Electric might uh, be able to save some money on the losses associated with delivering electricity from far away to a given neighborhood. Say, well, we could actually make electricity on these rooftops, which is closer, avoid those losses, mm -hmm. and then be able to spend a little bit more money increasing the hosting capacity in a way that actually makes everybody better off. So, so in order to do this with your dashboard, you have a lot of, have to have a lot of data very, very large amount. Large amount of data. How do you get this data? We use uh, computer vision algorithms, machine learning. We uh, digitize very large amounts of information about the built environment. So we look at, for example, the size and age of buildings, the socioeconomics of their occupants that might tell us a little bit about how much electricity they're likely to use and when. And all of that rolls up into some estimate of uh, how much you can fit of a given technology on the grid, the hosting capacity, mm -hmm. and, and where there might be opportunities to save money by um, driving more localized uh, acquisition of those distributed now, if we were, resources. Now, if we were using the old-fashioned model, you know, Hawaiian Electric as the generator of all power and, you know, mm -hmm. sending it out to the world, we wouldn't need you, but we need you because we now have distributed energy resources. Is that it? Or would you have been relevant in the first phase? Uh, it used to be. For about 120 years, we did a pretty good job just averaging out the costs. Um, you decide that there's enough need for a new power plant, 
You go build it over the life of the power plant, you charge just enough to recover that cost, and everybody is, is very happy. But now... What has happened now is that technology costs have come down for things like solar or storage, uh, and as a result of that, there are opportunities for people to deliver, uh, maybe produce their own electricity or shift when they consume electricity to periods of time when it's cheaper in ways that complicate the ability to, to capture the value of those larger bulk power resources like new power plants. And so we have to bring new tools to the table, to, to the, the regulatory process, to the utility planning process, and really to the way we actually think about markets maturing over time or we're building inefficiency into the system precisely at the point where technology is accelerating the ability to arbitrage that inefficiency. So when we talked about, um, about the um, advanced inverters before, I mean, it's clear that Hawaiian Electric and Hawaii are sort of ahead of the curve on this. We're, we're pushing the envelope. How are we doing in, in uh, this capacity issue? Um, are we pushing the envelope on that too? Ab absolutely. Ho Hawaii is way out in front. Um, it, it's not necessarily the most comfortable place to be. The spear tip <laughs> is the first part that gets poked into things. Um, but uh, it's actually a great place to be learning. Uh, and Hawaii, as both as a utility, Hawaiian Electric, the state uh, uh, as a whole, and, and the different elements of the industry are all learning a lot as a result of, of this process. I, I will say that um, it's okay to make mistakes when you're out in the front. All of those are learning opportunities, and we will collectively get better at that process as long as we're open about, about evaluating them and trying to make sure the maths being done are reasonable. Well, when do we come to, uh, you know, when do we come to a resolution? When, when, is, your, when is your job done? <laughs> when, when do you reach nirvana? You know, Kavala, nirvana, that's what yeah, I'm saying. We're, we're, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... Uh, a, a much longer time than many people think. Um, be mindful of the fact that uh, many of these uh, older resources have been around for a very long time. The, um, the first power plant in the country uh, that was five megawatts or larger, uh, there's still a substation there 115 years later. And now that it's been replaced with a bigger power plant, but the wires that are running there, still there. <laughs> Uh, so this system moves very slowly. There are trillions of dollars invested. Even more hard to move things like rights of way, right? Which is like you ran a transmission line through there. You paid a farmer for the right to use that land or the air above it. Those things don't move. They don't go away for a long time. So it, it is hard to move a system that is as large and complicated um, as, as this is um, in, in a speedy way. It's unwise to. And so things like smart inverters and things like deliberative uh, stakeholder processes are designed to do that in a safe way. Mm -hmm. one, one more question, okay. <clears throat> this is all this we've been talking about, the inverters and the capacity building and the new way of looking at things. Does this make the grid more resilient, more secure in the face of you know, potential outages and the like? I would have to say no. Okay. I mean, we're getting there with the advanced inverters, but the way things are no, now, no. And if you just think about it, it has to do with um, about the, the, you can't really depend on these. I mean, so PV's great when the sun's up. Yeah. You need a large cloud bank passes over. It's not. Yeah. Wind turbines work when there's wind blowing. Yeah, you still have those issues. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's yeah. going to change on that score. Yeah. <laughs> but what do you think, Aram? Yeah, I would actually argue the exact opposite, um, uh, obviously in a respectful way. I think um, <laughs> what, what has happened is for the last century, we got really good at overbuilding the system to build in that resiliency. Uh, and so we would do that by saying, let's pretend the largest power plant shuts down. Um, and as a result of that, we need another power plant that's just like that. And that level of inefficiency at scale is very expensive. Large transmission lines, large power plants. And when those fail, it's actually a big shock to the system. Yeah. So a uh, cloud passing over a small neighborhood, a portion of an island, is actually a much smaller impact than losing a whole power plant that might supply a quarter of all of the electricity to the island. And so we're in a period of flux right now, but I think that we're going to end up with a much more resilient grid uh, as we move 
through this transition period. Well, you know, the technology catches up. Yes, yes, and, and that's the mission. Right. To find it and to frame it and deploy it and so forth. <clears throat> it's great to talk to you both. Uh, so, uh, Veronica, time for you to summarize the second phase of our show today. Absolutely. So, the second uh, part of the show, we talked about hosting capacity. It's basically a methodology that the utility uses to assess at a given point in time how much more uh, renewable resources we can, the grid can take at the circuit level as well as the system level. Val is looking at, at some really interesting modeling that's not only looking at like from the technical aspects, but also looking at economic and value aspects. There was a question around, uh, is all of this new technology, all of this renewable energy, storage, et cetera, advanced inverters making the grid more resilient? It sounds like, like there's, you know, mixed uh, reviews on that, but it, I also feel that there is an optimism that as new technology, uh, I guess, becomes uh, more commonplace in the market, uh, standards are developed around it, et cetera, that there really is a huge opportunity to make the grid as a whole more resilient and more secure. So with that, thank you so much, Aram. Thank you so much, Arlene. And of course, you, Jay, for having me on the show. It's well, I'm so very fun. optimistic. That's what, optimism, the operative word that will also be in the final exam. Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.